just pray that with hope and in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so this evening, we are going to come to the end of the beginning. It's the end of Mark, but Mark, like all the Gospels, is the beginning of the last days. The last days begin with the first advent or coming of Christ, and they end with the return of Christ. And so as we wrap up Mark this evening... I'd just like to share with you that Mark is, as we mentioned at the outset some two years ago, uh, maybe written as early as the 50s A.D., which makes it the earliest gospel written. And when Luke picks up the story of the church in the book of Acts, Luke having written the gospel of Luke, he then in Acts 1-1, writing to the same fella, Theophilus, says the gospel was that he shared in his gospel of Luke, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. So the gospels are the beginning of what Jesus is doing. The work of Christ continues then throughout the New Testament on into today until he comes back through the church, empowered by the Spirit. And again, we continue the work of Christ. Now, that said, we land at the end of Christ's earthly work here in Mark chapter 16. And I want to pick up in verse 9, where we left off two weeks ago, uh, where Jared taught of the resurrection of the Lord. And so starting in verse 9, now, when he, Jesus, rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of who he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept because they didn't believe he would rise. They thought he was dead and gone. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. And after that, he, Jesus, appeared in another form to two of them on the road to Emmaus, we learn in Luke, as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it, to the rest, but they did not believe them either. And later, he, Jesus, appeared to the eleven, that is, the disciples, the eleven without Judas, who by this time has hung himself, as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. By the way, just take note there, he rebuked them not for their fear when he was being arrested and crucified. He rebuked them not for them fleeing, but he rebuked them for their lack of faith or their unbelief. And he said to them, go into all the world, verse 15, and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so verse 19, then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And he, they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word through accompanying signs. And then the last word, amen, or so be it. Now we arrive at this section in Mark as we close our study in Mark. And if you have uh, a study Bible or you have a Bible with margins in it, um, then you'll probably read something uh, like this section in Mark chapter 16, verse 9 through 20, is not in all of the earliest manuscripts. And some Bibles even went as far as to like take it out and just to put it over at the side. What this comes from is um, a science of textual criticism. And I put up here for you on the right that 
Textual criticism involves the ascertaining of the true form of a literary work as originally composed and written by its author. But as it pertains to biblical study, there are two forms of textual criticism. And I won't belabor you with the details, but the first form is lower criticism. It's been around for a long time. And what lower criticism does is objectively questions the date, the preservation, the transmission of a particular writing, in our case, a New Testament manuscript, and how it relates to other New Testament manuscripts. And so it compares things so that we get uh, the best possible interpretation or transmission or translation. Now, the second form of criticism is higher criticism. And this criticism really was birthed out of the 19th century Western European rationalism movement. And so, unfortunately, this is more secular, even though it's weaved its way into uh, Christian universities and, and thought. And so this particular secular brand of criticism questions the origin of the text, did who it says really wrote it, did they write it, and it questions everything. Is it really saying what it means, and it looks behind the scenes, and it tries to pull back the curtain? And essentially, it is a skeptic form of questioning, and it really relies upon reason more than revelation. And so uh, having just had several classes that pertain to higher criticism, I hope I never have to see it again. And uh, I don't want to approach the Bible as a skeptic necessarily and from a secular point of view. So as you can see, it's kind of in my mind a little counterproductive. But I share that with you because these guys are always, uh, especially higher critics, examining early manuscripts. Now, when we talk about manuscripts, you need to understand something. The, the original uh, books of the Bible, when written down by the people God inspired, those writings were called autographs. There are no autographs remaining of the Bible. There are no uh, firsthand documents remaining. But we have, in the New Testament, thousands of manuscripts, which are the copies of those, as close as, in some cases, uh, 50 to 100 years from the original autograph. And that may seem like a long time to you, but uh, in day and age where everything was hand copied, that's like just me telling you something and you writing it down nearly. I mean, it's, it's right there within the first uh, generation of the autographs. Nevertheless, because of all of this study, and specifically what's been birthed out of that 19th century kind of secular look at it, people question all kinds of things in the Bible. And there are really three passages in the Bible that get nitpicked by higher critics more than any other. And Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20 happens to be one of them. So I would be not doing this justice if somebody looked in their Bible and saw that and we didn't cover it. So let's get it out of the way real quick and then we'll move on. Uh, if you have a Bible, especially like an ESV or NIV, it will probably be one because of the manuscripts that they prefer that make sure they note this in your Bible. And it'll go something like this, the green uh, little cutout there on the screen. Uh, it'll say, well, look, they're not found, these verses, in the Codex Sinaiticus or the Codex Vaticanus. And so these are some of the earliest manuscripts that we have in totality. And so they say, look, they're not found there. Eusebius, who's a first century scholar in Jerome, uh, maybe one of the most famous early church fathers, fifth century, say it was, is not in the original. Um, very abrupt changes, higher critics say, from Mark 16, 8 to, to verse 9, like the, the Greek's not the same. And, uh, and so then other ancient manuscripts, they say, have a third and a different and a shorter ending. And in fact, they do. But then uh, think about this for just a second. For the first part, when you look at Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20, there's not anything, not one doctrine taught in these verses that contradicts any other doctrine in the New Testament. That's why it would be allowed to be in the canon of Scripture. Secondly, um, as I put here in the white cutout, though the verses are not found in the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus, 
three of the five oldest manuscripts have these verses, and not only that, but all the other hundreds of Greek manuscripts except just a handful have these verses. And then, and then past all that, just think about this. The New Testament was hotly contested by people who were trying to discredit Christianity that had woven, woven their way into the church, the Gnostics and whatnot, by the second century. And so what happened was the church had a bunch of councils to make sure that they ratified what was accepted as the New Testament. So these are the most godly men, just a, in some cases a couple generations removed from the disciples who have been circulating these 27 books that we have as gospel and New Testament, the way and the form and the shape that we have them now, they were sitting down in councils together and they decided, hey, I think this should should be how we pass it down. So uh, my take is how we have it is how we read it. Ready to move on? Okay, thank you. Now, that said, let's look at what gets taught here for us. Um, Jesus appears to the disciples. He rebukes them for their hardness of heart. And then verse 15, it says, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, you got to love Jesus. He rebukes them. But immediately after he rebukes them, he says, okay, now, get over it. Go into all the world and preach the gospel, right? Don't, don't have a pity party. It's okay. Uh, he knew that this was the first time that they had failed, nor would it be the last and so uh, what he does is he gives them the great, as we know it from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, the great uh, commission, or some would call it the great commandment. And it's go and preach the gospel. Now, let me just uh, share this with you. As a Christian, we have this great privilege of becoming a Christian, but we also get this great responsibility attached with it. Like we are to share what we've been impacted by. And in reality, uh, we always share what we've been impacted by. But most Christians, uh, at least in Western culture, kind of take this as the great suggestion. You know, Jesus, uh, Jesus suggested that we go and preach to all nations. And yet, here is something that uh, we've noted before as we've studied through the Bible. But the word go there is interesting. Um, if you have a lexicon, you can look it up. It's not like, you must go to all the world. I know you've never left cadet but you should go to Africa. It's, it's not like that. That's how it was preached to me as a kid. I'm in Redford. It's 7,000 people in our whole county. I'm riding the school bus with kids who've never been out of the county. I, I go to St. Louis only to get an eye operation, and if I can attend school every day, go ride the Screaming Eagle at the end of the year for, like, attendance reward. And they're like, go to India. It's like, I don't, even, I, does that, I don't know. What is India? I, it's Redford to me. Like, I'm still getting my mail once a week. You know, I'm on a party line. Uh, so it seemed, very, um, <laughs> it seemed very forced. And in fact, when I finally, um, when I finally left uh, Redford, Ellington, and got out and started studying a little deeper, I realized that it was a little forced because the, the idea is of the word go and preach the gospel. It's as you are going. Right, And so for some of us, we've been called to go here in Farmington most days. In fact, most of us here have been called to go in Farmington most days. But, you know, God may change that. Some of us may be called to go in a different uh, county or different state. Some of us may be, in fact, called to go uh, overseas, right? But as we are going, doing the things God has put on our heart, then the focus is on how we go just as much as it is where we go. Right? And the reality is if you don't share God and the gospel of Jesus Christ where you are, then you probably won't ever be any good sharing it anywhere else. Because so many people get caught up in the there that they, re they, they forget, hey, God loves the here just as much. But then here's the other side of it. God loves the there just as much as he loves the here. And so he's going to call people to reach both spots. And so the Great Commission is go and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, why, why do we not share? I think there's a couple reasons. First one is, uh, we think of preachers as Billy Graham, right? I mean, there's a preacher, and man, he, he was. That, that guy was a preacher. Um, but the reality is to preach is just to, to share kind of forcefully, to, be, to share what you're excited about, to herald is the actual word. And so in doing so, um, we share the gospel when we 
when we share what's on our heart in Christ, right? It's as simple as that. But that's the problem, I think. Um, most of us are afraid for a couple reasons. Many of us might be intimidated about how the thing will be received or being rejected. But I, I'd say more than, more than that, at least for most of us sitting here on Wednesday night, you guys love Jesus and you want to see people come to Christ. And so intimidation, really for the most part, you're probably past that, at least on your good days. And so on your uh, good days, it's not about intimidation, like will I get shot down or people think I'm weird, because you already figured out if you're, if you're actually humble enough that you, you're really weird. You are, you know. I love you, but I got one eye. So, it, so our, the problem isn't really artic, uh, intimidation, but it's like articulation. What, like how do I share because I'm not a preacher, right? And this is a problem in Western culture, like, and it's a problem I've shared with you before. Like one of the reasons we don't have a bunch of altar calls because I'm not any more preacher than you're a preacher. You have the responsibility of leading people to Christ. You get the privilege and the responsibility, right? And so we all go. And so um, typically when that's the case, most people that come in here have already been prepped by you. <laughs> if, if we lead anybody to the Lord at this place, it's because you were already doing the work of the Great Commission. And so articulation is not so much having to be Billy Graham where you put together uh, sermons and share with people the little nuances of the gospel, but it's it's just sharing your story. Right? I'd, I'd say the most powerful things that happen at our church, if you've been to the Wednesday nights and we have testimonies, that's that's the most powerful deal. And they they don't have to know anything more than this is just what happened to me. Right? You just share your story. If you're sitting in here and you've been walking with Christ for any amount of time, I'm sure you have some kind of life change. And the thing that keeps me going is I get to get up here and swivel this way, and swivel that way, and in every section, I'm, I'm looking at changed lives, transformed by the power of the gospel, and that story is the story that gets shared as we go out and fulfill the Great Commission as we're going. Now, um, verse 16, he, he says, he who believes and is baptized is going to be saved, but he who doesn't believe will be condemned. And the condemnation is something that, that every person has unless they're saved. Uh, they're already condemned by the fact that they're a sinner, and we prove that by the fact that they sin. And so if they believe and they're baptized, they'll be saved. And so there's this promise that anyone who believes can be saved. And yet, uh, because I'm kind of picking out little uh, pieces here uh, of detail tonight, let me just mention, as I have here for you, that this verse is actually one of a few that is used to promote uh, regenerational baptism or salvation by baptism. And so um, the emphasis is always put on the believe and be baptized. And so then people on the other side will say, well, no, the emphasis should be put on the believe, and then baptism is subsequent. But really, you don't have to worry about emphasis as much as you just have to read your Bible because, as you guys mostly know, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. And Jesus said, hey, today you'll be with me in paradise. <laughs> now, I did have some crazy guy a few years ago who was, so, he was super mad at me because I kept saying the word gospels, the four gospels. And he'd write me these notes and he'd say, he'd say there's only one gospel. You're a heretic, Pastor Mike. There's no plural in gospel. And so uh, then I, w you know, and I would try to be kind and then... Uh, and then finally, you know, he was, I realized that his deal was regenerational baptism. He believed that you had to be uh, baptized to be saved. And I mentioned to him about the thief on the cross. And then, and then he sent me a link, and he had written a book, and it's pretty amazing because uh, the, it worked out well because G Jesus, when he ascended and, uh, and took the thief on the cross with him, they went through a thunderstorm. Worked out well. Right, And so eventually he and I didn't get along very well because I had to basically say, stop writing me crazy letters because he was also like CCing half the people in the church into these crazy letters and the Pope and Billy Graham and all kinds of people. And, and, then, and then he hand wrote a letter and this is what I got. This is tremendous. I went to the, the mailbox one day out here and I pulled it out and it was, it was like a handwritten letter and I looked it up and it says, 
Pastor Mike, you play with the gospel like a little girl plays with a tea set. So, I feel a lot better about my stance, but um, you and I don't have to be baptized to go to heaven, but I do believe this, um, you and I must be baptized to experience the full scope of God's blessing, right? It's a step of obedience, and so you can get into heaven without being baptized, but why would you want to rob yourself of blessing? So um, let me just go through some things that baptism is real quick. And, and so baptism is an illustration, right? Jesus was illustrating when he was baptized uh, his death, burial, and resurrection. And then he was illustrating what happens to us when we uh, connect with Christ, when we accept him. We're buried in Christ, and the old man dies, and we rise again a new creation. And so it was an, it was an illustration. Um, Secondly, baptism is a proclamation, and this is, a, this is another reason that um, I, I was always scratching my head when I was a kid in the church environment I was raised in. We acted like the main proclamation of somebody's salvation was the altar call, and I, I don't think we intended to do it, but that's, that's what happened, and then baptism was kind of, it was kind of an afterthought, whereas in the New Testament, it's always like baptism is the proclamation. That's the way you say to the public I, I love Jesus, man, I'm identifying with him, and so he, he identified with me, and I'm going to identify with him, and so that's the public profession, or profession of our faith, I about made up a new word there, the profession, um, it's the public profession, and what we're doing there is, is baptism is identification, so Jesus was identifying with man, he didn't have any sin that he need washed of. But he was identifying with man because that's how people in Judaism earlier came to, to Judaism if they weren't uh, Jews. If you were a Gentile, you, you baptized into Judaism. So he was saying, look, here's how, here's how I'm identifying with the way that you come through. But then when we accept Christ, we identify with him through baptism. We're saying, I'm, I'm Christ folk. I'm Christ people. And then also uh, baptism is association. It's association with all the great cloud of witnesses that have ever been baptized into the body of Christ, right? You're saying, I'm one of you, and you're one of me, and we're in this deal together, and you're baptizing into the body. And then also, I think in some ways it's liberation. There is a spiritual uh, release at baptism. I believe this. Uh, your sins have already been forgiven. Um, but, but gosh, in the New Testament, 1 Peter 3, Peter compares the act of baptism to what happened with the world when the flood in the days of Noah took place. That the, the flood washed away and cleansed that and pushed Noah up to the top um, and, and gave him life. And then finally, uh, baptism is, I think, for impartation, and there's a special power associated with baptism. And that baptism, because you're being obedient, uh, God blesses. And in so many cases... In the New Testament, there is a, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit connected to baptism. So just think about Jesus. At his baptism, what happened? The Holy Spirit came upon him, and the Heavenly Father said, This is my son, my beloved son, in, what? in whom I'm well pleased, right? If he's well pleased with Jesus for being baptized, uh, how much more is he going to be well pleased with us, right? And then, and then secondly, Look in the book of Acts, in, the, in Acts 2.38 specifically, baptized, be baptized, Peter said, and receive the Holy Spirit, like there's a special outpouring. And so uh, repent and believe is salvation, and then believe and baptism is the expression of that belief. And so that's what was commanded for them to do. And then what would happen in verse 17 is the signs will follow those who believe in uh, my name, they'll cast out demons, and they'll speak with uh, new tongues, and if they take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them, and they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And so, um, you know, signs are going to follow the, the, the people filled with the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, unfortunately, you know, you think about people who don't compare Scripture with Scripture, and if you don't watch out, you can get some really wacky ideas like, uh, I just read this, and since 
the Lord says that you'll be able to take up serpents, then they're literally churches. They're fading away in America, but especially in the Appalachians and in the Smoky Mountains, where snake handling was a big deal, right? Like, this is how we fulfill. Let's, let's test the Lord on this. And so that was a sign of godliness. And, um, you know, I just, I go with what I grew up with, and that's a, a good snake's a dead snake. But all that said, um, it's not biblical, right? It's not biblical. And it's not biblical because uh, they were supposed to have these signs follow them as they were going into the Great Commission. Do you understand? So it wasn't these signs, these miracles, um, the casting out of demons and to speak with new tongues and to take up serpents. And if you drink something deadly, it'll, it'll be okay and lay hands on the sick. This wasn't when they were in their little holy huddle that this was supposed to happen. It's like as you're going, what Jesus was saying is God's going to protect you to fulfill the Great Commission, not not to like show off your godliness. And so it's as you were going, these signs will follow you, uh, you know, and essentially it's um, as they went, this would happen, not as they tempt the Lord, which is really what you're doing with the snakes. Right? And even Jesus told Satan, Satan says, hey, throw yourself down off this pinnacle so everybody will see how awesome you are. And, and Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now, that's not biblical, that expression, which is, you know, very much kind of um, not mainstream for sure. But then a biblical expression would be, you see these things happen in the book of Acts, Here's Paul on his way to meet Caesar. He's on a ship. They don't listen to him. They take off too late in the year. They get about 100 miles off the coast of Italy, and they shipwreck onto the island of Malta, and they all make it to shore on planks and boards and whatnot. And then they get to shore, and they have to build a fire because they're cold. And, you know, you see the servant's heart of Paul. He's helping, but apparently, according to church historians, Paul's got bad eyesight, and he's got runny stuff going on. He's all stooped over. So he picks up, like, apparently it was chilly being in the fall, and he picks up a big old pile of sticks and picks him up a snake. And when he gets ready to throw it into the fire, uh, then the snake, like, warms up and says, hey, I don't really care for this. And being venomous, it bites him on the hand. And then what's Paul do? It's like, oh, a snake just bit me on the hand, which tells you Paul's way godlier than me. Because if a snake bites me on the hand, it's going to look like a Stiltskin dance. I'm not kidding you. And, and Paul just goes, oh, a uh, venomous snake bit me on the hand. Hmm, shook it off in the fire. You know, and, uh, which I, I hear is the inspiration for Taylor Swift's great hit. You know, he just sh- 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 shake it off. So that said... Um, he shook it off in the fire, and, and it, the poison didn't get him, right? And so there, there have been times throughout history where God does this, and there are times in our life where if you look back, I'm sure you can see ways and, and instances God protected you, you know, miraculously. And so these uh, signs would follow them as they went. Now, that said, um, we get to the close of the letter and the gospel here of Mark, so then After the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven, and he sat down at the right hand of God. And so uh, they went out and they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. And so as we come to the last spot here, here's the ascension. So as Jesus ascended, he left. We understand that he left because he said, it's going to be better uh, for me to go. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. And he actually said to those who would follow him after he ascended, look, if you'll wait for the Holy Spirit, I'm going to do greater things through you than I did. And and it's mind-boggling to think that. But I've shared this with you before. In the book of Acts, there are 31 miracles listed in roughly 31 years. And so it seems like the book of Acts is just full of all these miracles. And I'm sure there were more than was listed, but there were 31 miracles in 31 years. And if we were to all tell our stories we'd have more than 31 miracles in this group in 31 years. People would have been healed. People would have been saved. People would have been 
uh, kept from disaster. People would have been seen through stuff that nobody thought they would be seen through, right? We would have more than that right here, and God in our midst doing more than Jesus would do because he was confined to one place in one body. And we have the same spirit in us that he has because he left the spirit when he left the earth. And so Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, and here's the awesome deal. There he is in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, says he lives forever to make intercession for us. Right now, he's interceding for us. He's praying. He's, he's taking the prayers that we pray and giving them to the Father, and he's taking those groanings we can't utter. He's translating those things to the Father, and apparently he's even praying prayers that we don't know we need to pray. And he's praying for us to the Father. He's an advocate, is what First John says, a defense attorney with us or the Father. You come in on Wednesday night, you don't feel like you got a lot of Jesus going on, you just limped in here, and the devil, devil may be up there whispering what he's whispering in your ear. You, you know, you should have just stayed home, you're not worthy, you should be more godly, whatever he's saying. And, and Jesus says, yeah, it's all true. <laughs> Every bit of it's true, but I'm his defense attorney. Now, get thee behind me, Satan. And so that's where he is. And then what he does is he gives us his spirit, and the book of Acts is the continuation of the work of Christ on into today. And so Jesus looked at the disciples. He said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to prepare a place for you if I go away. And when I come back, you're going to have this, this awesome mansion. But get this. He said to them, uh, keep it up. Do business till I come. Keep going, right? And so we live in this interesting um, in-between. We're this unique group that gets to live in between the first and the second coming of Jesus. And uh, no, matter if, no matter if you believe like me that the return of Christ is imminent, I, br I believe looking around, he's coming back, um, and he's coming back soon. Right? And then there's some people who be like, ah, they've been saying that for years. I'm like, well, just read what Peter said, he said, in the last days, there'll be scoffers saying everything continues the way it always was. But you look around, I mean, I, I'm a little bit limited visually, but it looks like things are coming to a head spiritually, you know, uh, economically, um, environmentally. It's just all these things are coming to a head. And so I think Jesus is probably coming back. But look, if, if, if I'm wrong about reading all the signs of the times, I'm definitely today closer to Jesus coming back than I was yesterday. And tomorrow I'm going to be one day closer. And no matter if I see him come back in my generation or not, pretty soon this life being a vapor, I'm going to breathe my last and I'm going to go see Jesus. And, uh, and, and yet I want to be busy till uh, he comes for me or, or I go to him, right? And we get the privilege of being great commission people. And think about this. He gives us all the power we need. Yeah, we get to swing and miss. He cleans it up. He said, hey, stop being faithless. Now let's do the Great Commission together. That's pretty awesome, right? No big, long lectures. Just let's get it right back on course. He gives me the faith to believe, and then he gives me the ability to make mistakes, and then he corrects me, and he grows me. And through it all, together, we represent the image of Christ to people around us. And Tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, you here on a Wednesday night, you're the only Jesus lots of people are ever going to see. You're it. And uh, you could look at that as a burden or a terrific privilege. Right? So uh, think about that. That Jesus picked you to reflect himself in a specific way to some bodies. Right? I mean, it's just, if you look back, it's just the, amazing to think of what God has done in your life. Just think about it for a minute. I mean, I'm a one-eyed guy from Ellington, and look at me. I got a little puffer vest on, and I'm preaching for Jesus. I mean, just think of where, where God has taken you and what he's done with you and how he's seen you through, and, and then you, you won't have a problem sharing, and when you share, it'll become infectious to share some more. And so, Father God, help us to continue the work of of Jesus Christ. Not out of obligation, although it'd certainly be good. Paul said if he didn't care how the gospel got preached as long as it was preached, 
But Lord Jesus, please, if you would, uh, give us the unction and the courage and the, uh, the fervor to share what you've done in our lives in word and in deed. And Lord, uh, we just thank you that you're living and you're true. And Jesus, that you sit at the right hand alive and everything's on your timetable. And we praise you, Lord. We worship you. I thank you for this group, Lord. What an exciting thing to get to look out on people so hungry for the word of God. And, uh, and Lord, we just pray that you'd let it soak into their uh, very bones. And like Jeremiah, they couldn't withhold it even if they wanted to. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you guys stand?